with it. Amen. So I love that. Got your Bibles? Or however you look at the Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Job. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Job. Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible. It's contemporary with Abraham. When I look back and I realize how much revelation and understanding that we have by knowing the Word of God, and you pick up on a historical character like Job, you realize he had, he had to walk in things and learn about God, and figure out things, why he was on this earth. He didn't have science talking to him. He didn't have a theologian talking to him. He had some knothead friends. He lost uh, 10 of his children, had died. His health had gone bad. And so much so that he, he thought that he actually made a statement that, uh, just go ahead and take me, God. Book of Job, chapter 14. Are you comfortable? That yeah, says four. Is it four? It could be four. Maybe I wrote the wrong one here. I'll tell you in just a minute. Yep, I'm right. Chapter 14. Man, I hate being right all the time, Clinton. If only you would hide me. I want you to hear this lament. If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger is past. So Job thought everything that was happening to him was because God was mad at him. His children dying, his economy lost. You thought the same thought. Your car breaks down, toilet clogs out, all kind of problems in the house, kids acting up, screen doors falling off the back porch. God, why are you mad at me? We've all done it. He had a reason to do it. So he said, God, you can conceal me with your anger. It's past. If only you would set me a time and then remember me. Next verse. If a man dies, will he live again? The days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. King James says it like this. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. Wait till my change comes. This morning, I want to share with you a message called Wait Till My Change Comes. I think of this thought, waiting, waiting. He, he's not talking about getting better in life. As I look at my life, I'm, I've been waiting. I'll be 62 next month, and I want to tell you something. If this is the change I've been waiting on, I am disappointed. My skin's getting wrinkled. My hair's turning gray. I'm stumbling a little bit more. Uh, gravity's working on me more every day. Amen. If this is the change, Kenny, we were waiting on, we are disappointed. But he's talking about another change. He's almost, Marie mentioned like he's a, a worm. He even makes a statement every now and then in the book of Job like he feels like he's a worm, like a worm in a cocoon that's going to become a butterfly. He realizes something's got to take place when this cocoon that we're in, this earth suit, changes. Have you ever been in a, um, a dressing room or maybe at home and you're, 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 you're going through, a, you're putting on something there, and you're taking something off, and by the time you get it taken off, the door flies open, and you yell, hey, wait a minute, I'm changing in here. Anyone ever had that humiliating moment? I think we all have at one time or another because it catches us unclothed. It catches us in, in a, a, a little bit of an embarrassing moment. We're not quite ready, and the door just flies open, and it's always what we say, hey, I'm changing in here. I think life on this planet has a whole lot to do with, hey, I'm changing in here. Amen. I, I mean, I'm a little humiliated right now. You caught me in my skeevies. Amen. You caught me in a, in a bare moment. You caught me in, in a time when I, when I, I wish you hadn't have saw that because you can't unsee it. Come to get an amen. 
But listen to me, I'm changing in here. And that's what Job is saying here. I'm going to wait till my change comes. I'm, I'm hanging around here because I know something's got to be after this. Something's got to take place. Father, I thank you for your word. Your anointing rests on, on your servants, on our ears to hear, to grasp what the word says. I ask, Lord, that you use my lips to share it. In Jesus' name, everyone shout. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. He said, "All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes." There's all kind of time. I'll talk to you a little bit about time this morning. First off, an appointed time. To me, it was appointed for me to be here this morning. For a lot of you, you set your clock. But he said, "All the days of my appointed time will I wait." Now, it's important for you to. Uh, this would be some of those that you want to take little snap pictures of to help you remember about some things. But appointed time is to mark by a limit to determine, ordain uh, of divinely appointed seasons. Uh, you know, it's, it's appointed. Time is located, now listen to me, in the parentheses of life. When I use parentheses, just like it is in, in your English language, when you understand parentheses, it's something that you want to capture or, or caption at that moment. So it's right there. So that means we are parenthetical people. We only live here, and this is what bothers us. We don't know what's on the other side of these parentheses. We believe one way might be hell, the other way it's going to be heaven. Can I get an amen? But we live right inside this capsule, if you would, and being there, uh, life is a little bit different. Time is the place that God sets apart to accomplish his plan. The word time, and I love this answer here, and I think it's so important, somewhere in infinity, God interrupted a place called eternity. God knew eternity always hung out. But God decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to interrupt eternity. And I'm going to put people there. And I'm going to create a space called time in that parentheses for a place called earth, for a race called mankind. Wasn't that powerful? That God's going to do all that for us. He interrupted it. And one day he's going to pull us out of this and we'll live where there'll be no more time. That's why the scripture says we'll go to a place where there's no more night. We can't conceive that. We, it, it, we struggle. We fight. Our, our pea brains just can't seem to grasp exactly what it is. But God shoves us inside this time. And, and Job's saying, I'm waiting till my change comes. Now, there are several types of time. There's chronos. Amen. Designates a period of, or space of time. I have a watch on. It's, it's, it's a chronos. It tells me what time it is. Amen. There's a chronos in the back to tell me when to hush up. Amen. So we watch for that, that, that moment. Then there's caros. It's a due measure, fixed, definite period or season. Opportune time. We often talk about caros moments. An opportune season. When it's right to purchase. When it's right to sell. When it's right to marry. When it's right to uh, bury. When it's right. These are caros moments. You never know when it's coming. In the church life, can I tell you, our teenagers had a caros moment this weekend. It was an opportune season of harvest. Something good happened in that time space. It's important. So, chronos denotes, denotes quality. Quantity, excuse me. While caros denotes quality. One tells me how much time there is, and the other one tells me how good that time was. Can I get an amen? When you go on vacation, it should be a caros vacation, an opportune season for you to find something, do something there. Amen. So, the plan was set before time began. You got a birth certificate, and then someday someone will get a death certificate. Amen. These are the times, the parentheses, that were put in. Acts 17 tells us, from one man he made every nation of man that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should be. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Have you ever asked yourself, why do I live in Dayton, Texas? Why do I live in Channel View or Crosby? Amen. Why do I live in this area? The Scripture is your answer. Amen. That God did something. Amen. He set you in a certain time and a certain place. There are times I felt like I might do better in the 1800s. You know, I'll, I'll dress that way. But the bottom line is God said, no, I'm going to put you in the, in the 2000s. So here I am, 2023, dressing like somebody from back over 100 years ago. And that's fine because they didn't live real long, and I've already made it pretty good. Amen. 
So, so you realize that God did it, and he did it so we'd seek after him. I live here because this area taught me to seek after God. Amen. It did something in my life. So Job said, I realize I have an appointment, and it's called my time. There is something that must be accomplished, and I have a part in it. Now, there are all types of different appointments. Ecclesiastes 3.1, to everything there is a season. There's a time to every purpose under the heaven. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. A time to plant. And there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill. A time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time, a time, a time to weep, laugh, mourn. A time to dance. A time to cast away stones. A time to gather up stones. A time to embrace. A time to refrain from embracing. A time to get. A time to lose. A time to keep. A time to cast away, a time to rend, which means to tear, a time to sew it back up, a time to keep silent, and there's a time to speak. There's a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. So these times have never stopped. You just got to learn where you fit in with that time. When it's time for you to talk or not talk, time to go to war or not go to war. Then there are set times. Psalm 31, 15 says, my times are in your hand. This is important. My times are in his hand. Message in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 6 says, When they were together for the last time, they asked the master, Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Is this the time? And he told them, You don't get to know the time. Timing is my father's business. Hear me. Timing is daddy's business. And every one of us wondered, Why did this happen when it happened? And I have to back up and say, timing is God's business. When I think of Job, said, I'm waiting till my change to come. He's saying, this cocoon has to change. There has to be a metamorphosis. Something's got to shift inside of me. So this understanding of set times, times by now, my now, my then, my when, my after, my always, my evening, my due season are in his hands. It's all in his hands. And when you live like your time is in his hands, it changes the way you live. I take more risk in life because I know my life is in his hands. Amen. I know that he's got me. He's been looking after me. So listen to me. Times in his hand, the word hand there means the open one indicating power, means, and direction. So not only am I sitting in his hand, I have means, I have power, I have direction. He takes care of me. He favors me. So if my time is appointed by him and is powered by him and the means for that time is supplied by him, then that time cannot end till he says so. In other words, I ain't leaving this planet till God says go. I said I ain't leaving this planet till God says go. You may struggle about last month when I did a 14-year-old's funeral. And I have to preach this because I'm telling you, I don't know when your exit time's coming and how much time you get here on this planet. But every day there is a chronos 24 hours that I've got to have a little Kairos moment in it. I've got to do something in that moment. I've got to believe God and love God through that time. So I just stand on this book and, stay and hold on to it. So I'm going to tell you, say this with me. Whatever my time is, my time is. It's, in it's in his hands. Say it with me. Whatever my time is, my time is. it's in his hands. Amen. I got to leave it there. I got to trust him in that. Job 13 again said, if only you would hide me in the grave. And conceal me till your anger is past. If only you would set me at time and then remember me. I love the fact that Job could just talk straight up to God. He didn't back away. He didn't get mushy. He said, God, if you got to put me in the grave, I feel right now you mad at me. And if you mad at me, you need to hide me till your anger gets on by. Amen. But help me till my change comes. Then there's Paul's time. Everybody in this church loves Paul's time. Waiting. They put you on pause. Would you wait until I get back with you? Uh, waiting. Waiting. The song said, waiting until my change comes. I will wait. This season represents the metamorphosis of time. That waiting. That In every one of you, if you've had any outdoor experience at all, you have seen cocoons. When it, you looked at it and, and, and it started to move and you realized, I, I, I need to help that worm out of there. And if you dare do that, then you stop that whole struggle that that worm's got to go through to become that butterfly. He needs that struggle. And in all of our lives, we need those struggles that take place, whether it be little or great, to help us transform into this moment. And I want to tell you, life is simply a whole lot of struggle. 
There's a lot of struggle in this life. They don't get that. That's happy, I know, but there's a whole lot of struggle. Job said this, so this season represented that. A, a, a prudent man knows when why he's waiting. This is important. A prudent man knows why he's waiting. Proverbs 14, 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. Stop, think about it. But the folly of fools is deception. The word prudence is exercising sound judgment. It is a decision reached through discernment or critical evaluation. You've been through stuff. You've seen things. You've learned enough. You're evaluating. Before you buy that vehicle, you need to have some waiting time and decide, can I afford that? Can I afford that home? Can I afford this relationship? Can I afford this business I'm fixing to move into? Have you counted the cost in life? Let me help you real fast. This is a powerful statement. If you live life from behind, you always stay behind. But if you can live life ahead, normally you'll stay ahead. What do you mean, Pastor? Before I'd ever purchase or get into anything, I'd make sure that I had enough finances to take care of that and more. Because here's what the, uh, this our economy does this to you. Can you just afford this month? And then they'll start percentage rate on that. Next thing, you, you paid three times for whatever thing you just bought. So if you could save, and if you can get ahead, amen, and be able to pay down and, and keep that thing rolling that way, if you get ahead, you stay ahead. But if you start from behind, my God, you stay behind. Amen. Oh, that's good preaching right there. I know you didn't understand. You didn't know I understood anything about economics. Uh, or, 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 never mind. So it's the ability to make right decisions at rough times. It's a rough time. I got to make the right decision. Come through the pandemic. Rough time. Did you make the right decision? Did you do the right thing? We all ponder that in our lives. Proverbs 22, 3, a prudent man sees danger, takes refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. So it's learning to realize, okay, there's a time for me to back up. There's a time for me to press forward. But it's a pause time right here. Part of making mature decisions is knowing when not to make a decision. When you are discouraged, don't make a decision. When you are backslidden, when you're homesick, when you're angry, when you're, uh, when you're enticed, when you're passionate, when you're too much passion, be careful about making a decision there. When you are impatient, my, uh, I was asked the other day, uh, how, many, how many wrecks have you been in, Pastor? Two major ones. But one of them was made because I was impatient. All I had to do was go down to the next exit. But no, I got to take that turbo across the road. Because I, I know I can make that exit. <laughs> Cost me a train ride back to Memphis. Hey, man, I couldn't even drive my car out. Wrecked that thing right up there after a camp. So you got to know when to do it. So there is such a thing as being taken out too early. Let me say it again. There is such a thing as being taken out too early. You can become impatient. You can run into danger. You can get yourself in a situation. Hey, man, you get to heaven and God say, why are you here now? Didn't need you now? Well, but, 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 but nothing. Hey, Amen. Be a little more prudent next time I put you someplace. I don't know if God would do that. Amen. Promise time. Then it's promise time. Stay with Jesus till your change comes. There's a promise time. Job said, till my change comes. Change to pass on, to grow up, to mature. Till my change comes. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So whatever God started in you, whether it was at Hot Hearts or whether it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, but when God started work in you, he wants to continue that work in you. It's a good work. Everybody say good work. Amen. So he's performing to complete, to finish, to accomplish. God's got something for you to do later. So he's performing a work in you now. You may feel like you're hidden in a cocoon in a dark place and God don't see you, but there's a metamorphosis taking place. There's a change coming in all of our lives. The word perform there. One more thing. When a thought is so strong that one wants to see it manifest, let me tell you what that is. That's you. God thought about you so long he thought about how he would make your head, your arms, your feet, your body, put your organs in there, give you one liver that will reproduce itself, give you two kidneys, lungs, uh, ears, nose. He thought about you so long that he decided, I'm going to manifest you. I'm going to bring you into being. Have you ever thought about anything that's ever been developed or created or invented was first thought before it showed up? And when God looked at you, in his mind, you were there. And he thought you out and found a way to put you here. Everything about you, he thought. He thought, I, I'm going to make a, a, a skinny redhead, long-haired man. And Keith Sanders showed up. 
Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. So he knew me at my birth. He knew me. Psalm 139. Give me a little moment here. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know, when I sit down, when I stand up, you know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it. Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Why is that? Because David said, I'm in his hands. Amen. Then he walks on and says, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the furthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as if I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. My oh God, that's poetic. You ever just picked up a little handful of sand and decided, I think I'll count every little grain in here? No. It's too much for your brain to try to feed. There ain't no way you'd try. You'd, you'd be picking up, you'd stare at it, and you'd go, I, I'd be here for weeks trying to count. And God said, all the grains of sand. Now, I'm not talking about Galveston. I'm talking about the Sahara. Amen. I, I'm talking about all the grains of sand. That's how much I think. See, we can't fathom that. We can't grasp hold of that. But God said, that's how much I thank you. I was there when you were born. And let me tell you something else, son. I'll be there when you pass. Hallelujah. Listen, the change is coming. You got to push, push on forward. 2 Corinthians 5, the Spirit of God whets our appetite. Oh, no, I jumped ahead too far. Let me get somebody up here on the piano if I could or guitar or whatever. We will know, he will know us at our death. Of all the fears that plague the heart of man, none is greater than the fear of death. It's our greatest fear, the sum of all other fears. We're afraid to die. We are. We, we, we don't want to do it. Uh, we, and I'm not telling you that I'm not. Amen. We, we are afraid of what happens when we die because death is a fundamental human problem. We've never been to the other side. We just get glimpses of it in this book. You know, more movies have been written seeking the answer to immortality. More, uh, you w almost show after show, only to lead to know the real answers. I, field of dreams, ghost, raiders of the lost ark, searching for that holy grail, so I can take a sip and live for eternity. Amen. Here in this book, he said that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son to whosoever believes in him should not die but have, have, have what? Everlasting life. So here's the holy grail. Here's the answers in the book. Hollywood ain't got the answers. Amen. Here's the answer. If you want to live forever, it's in this book. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. The life, everlasting life. Abundant life here, abundant life there. There's something about the eternity. He said, I knew you when you were born. And I gave you appointed times. I gave you set times. I taught you about Paul's times. Now I'm going to tell you about promised times. I promise you. When this cocoon of yours is over, change will come, and you will have a metamorphosis, and your body will change, and you will not be like you are here, for what you're fixing to get is not man-made, but it's going to be God-made. So he goes on to tell us, meanwhile, we groan. We do. We do groan and moan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. 
For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our, our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He talks about clothing. He talks about uh, not having clothes on. It's that moment that, that life barged in on you, and you want to yell, wait, hold it, close the door. I'm changing in here. And sometimes we need to throw a sign up and tell people around us, I know you keep pushing through the door. I've not changed yet. You see, my life's been changing for years, and one day there'll be an absolute change. But until then, there are increments of change. There's more joy in my life and love and patience. My life is changing. I'm always changing. My language is changing. What I think about the poor has changed. How to help people has changed. Amen, that, that it's important for me to give away my life has changed. So I'm waiting for the, all these changes to come. And the change comes pushing forward. 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, the Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. I love that verse. There's heaven in my heart. So as I'm fighting in this cocoon of life, and I'm thinking about how I'm breaking out, and when that day comes, what a glorious day. We've got old hymns, and we've got songs. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Job said, hide me till your anger's gone. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time, I'll wait till my change comes. Yesterday, I was at the hospital, MD Anderson, with a 30-year-old young lady, my sister. Sister in Christ, 30 years old. Got leukemia in 2021. She's brought people to our church and They've been blessed by our house. She was a go-getter. Her husband, a little gangbanger-looking fella, man, looked like he whooped a crowbar. Loves Jesus now. They come to our other church for about a year and a half. I got to call Pastor. You come. Actually, I went and saw her last week, and I saw her. Went to go see her this week, and she sent me a cool picture, and she was intubated. And I walked into that uh, ICU and I watched as her cocoon began to give way, as the oxygen levels began to drop, as her husband began to weep, I began to weep. And I realized at that moment that her change had come, that this cocoon just laid there. And I whispered in her ear as she was passing, you have fought a good fight. You have kept the faith. There is laid up for you a crown of righteousness, which our righteous judge will give you. And to all of us who are waiting, and we'll see you again. Life is not going to be easy every year. You're not going to get your resolution about all the things. It's just going to be another year. And you've got to decide how you're going to handle your time. If this church becomes an appointed time, if you've got a set time to do something, if you've got a time to go see kids play a sport, you better get there. Don't disappoint. Don't miss an appointment with them. Understand your parenthetical. You're right here inside these parentheses. Many of you I met at funerals. You understand this all too well. But God put heaven in our hearts. He whetted our appetite. He gave us just enough life here on this planet that we can enjoy when we get there. I wept with that father, husband, the mother. I can't help myself. You fall in love with people that you pastor, and you see them pass. But all I can think of is, sister, your days of suffering are over, and you fought a good fight. And I hate to say you were only 30. But that was your time limit here. So pray for this house. Pray for one another. Amen. We got good things ahead. Can I get an amen?
Amen. Wait till your change comes. Waiting, waiting doesn't always mean just sitting. Waiting don't mean sitting. Wait, waiting means occupy till I come. That's what Jesus said. Occupy. That means stay at it. Be effective. Do things for God. Amen. Realize that the change you're waiting on is not here on this earth. Because my God, if it is, we, we got, oh, I almost said a bad word. It's not a bad word, but it's not a word to use in this sentence. Amen. This is not the change we've been waiting on. Amen. The change we're waiting on is an eternal change. Hallelujah. God, prepare our hearts. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Lord, I ask you to touch this house. Remind us how much time we got left. Our time's in your hands. God, I grieve for the passing of a 14-year-old, a 30-year-old. It, it breaks my heart, but I don't have the answers. You're God. I like Job. Sometimes I want you to hide me in the grave so you're not mad at me no more because surely you're mad at me because I didn't make all this happen. Yet I understand. My change is coming. I thank you for this house. Help us to use our time wisely. Give us prudence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise.